Um, I'm not sure where to start. Um, certainly thank Valencia and Burkhardt and all the other pioneers of ISMB for setting up this just incredible organization. Um, I have a concession to make, which is not a very nice one, but this is my first time at an ISMB meeting. And uh, I guess I didn't really realize what I was missing, but I should also say that I always thought I hated Guinness until I tasted it three days ago. And I'm actually like crazy about Guinness. So, you know, I guess one can always learn and uh, try to deal with your prejudices. Um, in Burkhardt's introduction, which was thankfully really brief, and I enjoyed that, um, I think what motivates me is, is very simple. I just like playing with computers and everything else follows from that. So I guess, uh, you know, just sort of do what you want to do. Okay, so uh, my title is uh, Fun with Large Structures and Masses of Sequences. And it's sort of interesting that most of uh, computational biology today is one dimensional, it's in the sequence world. But computational biology really started with three dimensions. And it was probably 15 years into the, the birth of the field before sequences really seemed to matter. So it's interesting that we went from complicated to simple. Um, my talk is gonna say something very briefly about the birth of computational biology. Then a fairly long section on interesting mathematical methods, maybe mathematics is too strong, for solving large and difficult structures. Structures where conventional methods go wrong. And finally, uh, some work in recent work we've been doing in analyzing uh, sequence in, in, in a very large scale way. Um, it's often been said in, in criticism that I work on too many different things. And I guess I used to apologize for this, but I've stopped apologizing. And I work on lots of different things because they interest me. And as I said, uh, you know, well, almost everything in life shares computing. You know, I just really like the concept of computers and therefore I don't really care whether it's one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, or a thousand dimensions, as long as I get to play with the computer when I'm doing it. So the birth of computational structural biology basically went back to uh, things that were happening in the early 60s, late 60s. This is almost 50 years ago. And at that time, Schneer Lifson, this is a very small picture here, and Arya Varshal were working on something they called, oops, sorry. I'm gonna to have to make, if you could remove this please, sorry, it's gonna slide down otherwise. Okay, so um, Arya Varshal shown on the left, and Schneer Lifson, right, other way around, were working on ways of dealing with very small molecules using computers. This is the very, very beginning of computers in chemistry. And I actually got involved through the amazing foresight of John Kendrew, the person who solved the first protein structure, I wanted to do a PhD with him. And he basically said that I couldn't do a PhD with him if I didn't first spend a year with Schneer Olivsen in Israel. <coughs> and uh, this concept of his basically changed my life. It took me a long time to realize what an important decision it was on his part. So I went to Israel, worked with Aria and Schneer on programming uh, a calculation that would allow you to calculate the <coughs> structure, energy, and frequencies of any small molecule. They initially focused on hydrocarbons, and uh, that program actually took about six months to write. It's always been interesting to me that the time it takes to write a program seems to be six months, no matter how, much, how fast computers get. So, but it's probably how we define a program, so maybe it's unfair. Uh, so basically, Lifton and Varsha were working, oops, I'm sorry on an energy function like this, shown here, well, shown, sorry. It was there. 
energy function like this, which is sort of the canonical way that we represent molecules in a computer. This is a very simple classical expression. Whenever I say it's simple, I remember showing this slide to pre-medical students in the United States, and half the class walked out. I then said that I was shocked by this, and that I wouldn't go to a doctor who couldn't differentiate x squared. And I was then told I would die very quickly. So uh, I guess we have to realize that people have different attitudes to this information. So if you have an energy function like this, you can then basically use it together with very simple physics to calculate exactly how the system is going to, well, it's going to you're going to minimize to get a stable system, do no more mode to vibrate about the system, do molecular dynamics to get trajectories, and Monte Carlo for sampling. And these are all methods that have been around for a long time and are generic methods for any system. You could apply them to stellar dynamics, I guess population dynamics, uh, you know, diversity on Earth, and also to molecules. So uh, this led to my first paper with Schneer Lifson on energy minimization of a large molecule. The basic concept here was to realize that if you could do calculations on hydrogen and carbon, you could just sort of guess the energy parameters for oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, stick them in, and do energy calculations on large proteins. Uh, and although computers were really small back then, I think programs were typically 100,000 words. Now, words were about four and a half bytes. They were 36 bits long. So, you know, maybe half a megabyte. Uh, at about the same time, uh, with Arya Varshal, we developed a method for simplifying proteins by essentially throwing away many of the atoms. This made it possible to actually fold structures and computers as they were in the early 70s. And also, uh, going the other direction to make things more complicated by taking literally a handful of atoms, maybe six or seven atoms, and instead of throwing atoms away, add electrons. So suddenly every atom becomes 10 points or something like that. And this then gives you uh, an ability to deal with the quantum mechanics. So all of this stuff happened literally in the first, uh, maybe between 67 and 77. Uh, molecular dynamics became possible as computers got faster. Uh, and computers are steadily getting faster. Moore's law has been working since day one, just about. And we were able to do simulations of uh, proteins in water and DNA in water. Here's a movie that I just stuck in of DNA in water. It was done in 1990 by Miri Hirschberg. And this is an interesting case because nowadays we want to do simulations that are going to show us something new. Back then, we were just trying to do simulations that didn't fall apart. So in the early days, common sense like, gee, DNA is stable in water, were really important. And it turns out it's not so easy to do because DNA, which you know, we usually think about it as a string of sequences, so many of you are only concerned with this part of the DNA, is actually a lot of atoms moving in lots of ways. And the key thing about this movie is that nothing too much is happening. So the DNA, the ions are diffusing, the water's running around. There actually was a breakage of a base pair at the top here. But basically, things are more or less stable. So this was like a, a sanity check that we could do calculations right. Meanwhile, in the sequence world, uh, it actually took quite a long while for sequence work to become feel like mathematically intense. Uh, databases were actually very early. The two databases that I want to think about are Margaret Dayhoff's Atlas of Protein Sequence and Structure and Alvin Cabot's and Captain Wu's Sequences of immuno Immunological Interest. So these were books, physical books, that got updated every two or three years. But by the time uh, the Atlas of Sequences became digitized, that was like, I think, 91, there were already several thousand sequences that had been collected. This is still before we have DNA sequencing. Um, Needleman and Wunsch and Smith Waterman were very, very important uh, introductions into the sequencing world, uh, the protein sequencing world, uh, the issue of programming how you align two sequences. Um, basically, I think the origin of dynamic programming for aligning sequences was work that Kroskel had done in the 60s on aligning bird songs. He was really interested in how birds sing. 
And birds don't always sing at the same speed. They sing the same tune. So you have two different strings, and aligning them involves dynamic programming. And I very well remember when the sequence of Phi-X was determined by Bart Burrell with Fred Sanger in the mid-70s, uh, Bart Burrell actually came to me and said, was I interested in DNA sequencing? And I said, oh, no, 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 no. That's just too boring for me. It's in one dimension, you know. Talk to Roger Staden. So I guess maybe I missed an opportunity there. Um, so let me now move on to the, the main body of the talk, solving large and difficult structures. And we're going to talk about an important protein system, eukaryote chaperonin. So this work was done with Nia Kalisman, who at the time was a PhD a postdoc, and Gunnar Schroeder, who was a 10-year ex-postdoc, who is now an independent 10-year scientist in Zurich in Germany. Nia Kalisman has just moved into a tenure track position in Jerusalem. So the problem is chaperonins. So chaperonins come in two groups or two classes. There's group one, which occurs in bacteria, and there's group two, which occurs in archaea and in eukaryotes. Both proteins are like spheres or cavities. Uh, in the group one chaperonins, uh, this is actually showing the bottom part closed and the top part open, but they're actually symmetrical. Opening and closing of this cavity is done by a cap. In the group two chaperonins, the leaves actually close in and close out. So basically, this seems to ostensibly be a cavity that, through the use of ATP, can open and close. This just shows the group two chaperonin, the eukaryote and archaea chaperonin, in its open and closed state. Here's just a movie that was made by an ex-postdoc, Junji Chang, who did the EM of the archaea form. And you can see this thing in open and closed state. So essentially, uh, this molecule opens and closes. And perhaps it works as a chaperonin by simply having a cavity. An unfolded protein goes in. The molecule closes. It's now basically not going to interact with other proteins. It folds up. Everything opens. But the situation is actually more complicated. And the reason it's more complicated is that Although the three-dimensional structure of archaea chaperonin and eukaryote chaperonin is very, very similar, the sequence structure is very, very difficult. The archaea chaperonin usually has, there are actually eight subunits, it's hard to see here, but there are eight subunits going around one ring and then eight subunits in the bottom ring. And here in archaea, the subunits are generally either all exactly the same DNA sequence or protein sequence, or two, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. In all eukaryotes, from yeast to us, there are always eight different subunits, shown here in these eight different colors. And it turns out that these subunits are about 30% identical to those in archaea. And you know, blue is 30% identical to yellow or to orange or to whatever. But if you look at red from yeast, and yet, from, read from humans, they're actually 60% identical. So clearly, there's been a diversification of sequence preserving structure, which has been necessary for function. And this is interesting both because it's a sort of a mathematical problem. Something that immediately comes to mind is what is the order of the colors? And this is obviously something that people wanted to determine. But it turns out that it's a difficult problem. Now, how do you define a difficult problem? So one way to define a difficult problem there's lots of equally good outcomes. This means you can go wrong, you, know, you're, you can go right in one way, in wrong in 40,000 ways. And the reason there are so many outcomes is you can think about this molecule, which has actually 16 subunits, eight in the top ring and eight in the lower ring, as being drawn like this. And then you can take the paper around the outside and unwrap it. And then you have this object where the, eight, where the letters are different letters for different chains. The nomenclature is sort of strange because basically people like to use either Greek letters or numbers. And in keeping with people who work with protein coordinates, alpha is A and you know, gamma is G. It gets a little bit worse because it turns out that the sixth letter of the Greek alphabet, well, I think the seventh letter, is zeta. And all of us think about Z being the last letter of the alphabet. So it takes a while to get used to this. But the important thing is that you can arrange a string of colors like this in seven factorial ways, which you can always start with eight, it's a circle. And then you have to put the second strand next to the first strand. You can do that in eight ways. So altogether, it's eight factorial, which is 40,320 ways of doing this. Okay. Now, 
Another way you can tell things are wrong, and this is not so nice, is that others got it wrong. And this particular this molecule was looked at very carefully by two really good groups of experimentalists. One was cryo-EM, where Wachu was the cryo-EM person and Judith Friedman, the biochemist with the chaperonin. And after looking at this and collecting a million images, uh, they came up with this particular ordering of the colors. At about the same time, um, Lawrence Pearl, the crystallographer, together with uh, Keith Williston, a biochemist uh, in England, uh, did crystallography. They actually managed to get this huge object to crystallize. The resolution was fairly low. It was 3.8 angstroms, but that's way higher than the EM, and they came up with a different order. So that sort of suggests that either this molecule is... Now, it turns out that this was from yeast, and this was from, I think, bovine. So they are from different species, but the fact that the sequences of all the yellows in all the different species are the same and so on makes you suggest that there probably is one arrangement. Okay. So at this point, I got involved with mass spectrometry. I even wrote it wrongly. I'm sorry, forgive me. I've been doing this for the last... The last. So basically what happened was that Neil Kalisman wanted to work in my lab. He came there with a research proposal to do mass spectrometry cross-linking on proteins combined with modeling as a way to determine their structures. Now, as you can see, I still don't know the difference between mass spectroscopy and mass spectrometry, and it was much, much worse in those days. But, you know, Nia uh, wanted to do what he wanted to do, and I guess one of the reasons why I do lots of different things is that usually the people who work in my lab choose which direction to go, and I just enjoy working with them. So the basic idea is, is very simple, and as I've been around for a very long time, you take uh, a complex of proteins, mix it with a cross-linker, which is a reactive molecule that's about 25 angstroms long, then cut the thing up with trypsin to get these fragments, very carefully determine the mass of every fragment using mass spectrometry, and then using modeling, reconstruct the whole thing. Now, it turns out that it's a little bit better now, but when we started, there wasn't any software to do this. So Nia struggled very, very hard with her pipette to actually introduce the cross-linker into the material and get the reaction to happen. Then you're done. You basically take it over to the mass spec center. They do the trypsin digest. They run it through the mass spec machine, and they give you back a file, a half gigabyte binary file. Now, for most experimentalists, that would be end of story. But Nia was suddenly getting into his own. So he actually wrote a program in MATLAB, which I still don't forgive him for, uh, for analyzing that file. And when you do this, essentially what happens is you do what we called amateur mass spectrometry. Here is just showing what happens. You have two lysines on these two different subunits. You introduce the reaction. The reaction reactive molecule is called BS3. It connects these things. You then cleave it, take these pieces, and can determine their sequences, and hence exactly where they are. Uh, at the end of doing this, you come up with a list of crosslinks. Now, we were not doing this very well. We didn't use isotopes. We did it very simply. And we thought we would have probably an error of 1 in 20, which means that 1 in 20 of our crosslinks would be, be wrong. But it turned out that what was very surprising is that all the structure consists of something like maybe 8,000 amino acids. I mean, each, each of these lumps is five and a half, 550. So 550 times 16 is maybe 18,000 amino acids, has a molecular weight of megadalton, Eight crosslinks, if you're lucky, completely determine the arrangement of colors. And this might seem surprising, and Nia, who had at that time two children, his youngest, his youngest daughter was four, said his daughter could have done it. So I just thought, you know, he's just being arrogant and there's no way. But it turns out, and it's a little bit hard to see here because of the resolution, but this turns out this very first crosslink is between B and D. It, it, again, it's, it's a B. the resolution is terrible. That's B and D. So basically, if B is touching D, you can just put them together. And then in a very simple process, using a small number of crosslinks, you can just combine things. And you're, when you're done, you know that this is the order. That nothing touches H, but since it's a circle, H has to be at where, where it's open. So essentially, you can get this order completely trivially by looking at 20 crosslinks. Uh, this was very surprising and could very well have been wrong. 
So we then decided to do what we called combinatorial homology modeling. This was using Google to find a name which hadn't ever been used before. Combinatorial modeling is very well known, and combinatorial homology modeling, or combinatorial homology modeling is also very well known, but combinatorial homology modeling has never been used before. And the idea is sort of simple. Don't try to build one model, build all the possible models in a combinatorial space. So we had to build 40,320 models of the entire structure of chaperone, and then ask, are the crosslinks satisfied or not? So it's basically brute force. <clears throat> There's a picture that the crosslink is long. So basically, if, the cross, if a crosslink is formed, you can say that the two lysines are within, I think, 28 angstrom. So that's a long distance. But what helped us here, this is a very large molecule. So in such a large molecule, being closer than 25 angstroms is actually very informative. So what you do, basically, is you generate all different models uh, in three-dimensional coordinates. And then for each model, ask, does it fit the mass spec data? And you do this in two different ways. One is you ask how many distances that you predict should be close are actually close. And also, those that violate this criterion, do they violate it by a little bit or a lot? Because if the distance should be 25 and you have 27, that is much, much less of a problem than if you have 127. And that we'd call the sum of violation distances. By doing this, you can put all the dots, the 40,000 dots on a plot. Here you see what the previous works were doing. Obviously, there's a best one, which happens to be this, which is the same as you could deduce by four-year-old logic on the data. Uh, the second best one and the third best one have exactly the same colors in the ring, but the dislocation. So here you have green under green. Here the green is to the right of the upper green. And here the lower green is to the left. So these are just simple perturbations of the structure, but they're not the same. OK, so now this is strange. There's controversy. Two premier groups say one way, our mass spec with very amateur mass specs is another way. What do we do? So I've basically all my life been really happy that I use computers but really happy that I never learned statistics properly. And uh, <coughs> I do remember, probably in the mid-'80s, seeing the paper in Scientific American on Bootstrap and saying, wow, statistics meets computer. And I now believe that as an experimentalist or a theoretician, any good result should be regarded as an, arti as an artifact until proved otherwise. So you really have to look at your data, assuming that somebody in your lab or in the universe is trying to cheat you and has concocted this example to fool you and you have to prove exhaustively that it's okay. So what we did is a little bit complicated. Basically, um, you have these 20 crosslinks. And what you can do is you can say, okay, well, let's just take 10 crosslinks. If we took the 10 crosslinks, what would we get? Now, you don't just take the first 10 crosslinks. You do what's called a bootstrap sampling of 10 crosslinks, i.e., you take 10 crosslinks, and then you keep on resampling them, where you take maybe the first one twice, and you skip the second one, and the third one three times, and then just take five more unique ones. And then this is just simply done by essentially throwing a 10-sided dice, not worrying about repeats, and just picking out, throwing a 10-sided dice 10 times and picking out 10 new samples for your data. And you can do this many, many times. And what we did is we did that many times and asked how much more often is the how much more likely is the best structure to the second best structure? Because when you have a lot of different models, you don't care that there's always the best one. You care how much more likely is the best one than the second best one, and so on. And we found that once we had 16 crosslinks, the best one was about 10 or 12 times more likely than the second best one, and everything was good. So we published this, and this just shows what the thing looks like. Here is a model of the entire structure, and these are the crosslinks. So they're very small, except you know, this is a very large structure. This is more than 10 nanometers across. And there's actually only one crosslink, which determines the relative arrangement of the two rings, which is why you can get it wrong. But basically, we felt this was interesting. Now, this is basically saying, using mass spec, some amateurs without any experience can get the structure of a one, kilo, a one megadalton structure correct that couldn't be done by cryo-EM or crystallography. So we thought, OK. We didn't really want to get involved in cryo-AM, but uh, Williston and his co-workers had done a great deal of work with the crystallography. So could we use the same methods to go back to their data? 
They had crystallized this complex, which is no joke, and also collected something like a quarter of a million X-ray reflections. So could one, could, if one had been smarter, could one have got the right answer just from the crystal data? Now, the problem why these methods fail at low resolution is that normally most methods work by sort of a greedy approach. You think of a model, you start refining it, and you expect at some point there'll be a conflict with the data, and now you have to go back up and choose a new model. The trouble is, is that low resolution, you never reach that conflict point. Any model seems to fit the data very well. And the only way you can tell is if you don't do one model, you do either a random sampling of a thousand models or you do all possible models. Okay. So it turns out that in the unit cell that Williston and Kobukas had crystallized, Karen Decker was the main PI, well, the main, the main postdoc who did the work, there are actually two complete particles. It actually contains two megadaltons. And what's interesting is that in the crystal unit cell, two of the units form an almost perfect dimer. So in the unit cell, there's a perfect dimer, which is not used by the crystallography at all. And now the, so therefore, the problem you have to do is to work out all the colors in an object like this. And you can assume, as we did, that every ring has exactly the same order. But that doesn't actually help, because each of these objects can be rotated in eight different ways. And each one has 40,000 options. So essentially, the total number of ways you can color an object like this sitting in a fixed place in a unit cell is 8 times 8 times 8 factorial, which is about 2.6 million. So there are 2.6 million different models that could fit the X-ray data. So we initially found weak signals, and I'm going to skip that for lack of time. We decided that it turns out that if you have, uh, if you do things conventionally, if you build one of those models, one of the 2.6 million models, in order for you to tell whether it fits or not, you end up having to do crystallographic refinement using programs like CNS and Phoenix and other programs. And at the end of this, it takes two days, and at the end you get an R value, which is a measure of the fit between the calculated structure factors and the observed structure factors. It's essentially, it's a, oops, it's, a, it's a modular sum, but it doesn't really matter. It's just an index of agreement. And if that index is small, you're good. The trouble is, is that 2.6 million times two days is an awful lot of computer time. So we tried to do something that was simpler that everyone said would fail. What we would do is we would just generate all the models and for each model very quickly see how well it fitted the X-ray structure, the X-ray data, without doing any refinement. It takes about 10 seconds to calculate the structure factors, the crystallographic uh, diffraction for a molecule like this, and comparing it takes you know, essentially 10 seconds. And all of these are done in parallel. So we have 2.6 million parallel 10-second calculations, easy for a cluster. Now, our crystallographic friends said, well, all that's going to happen is that all the values are going to be 50%. It turns out that, for whatever reason, the way the R value is calculated, 50% is what random structure factors give you. And they were right, and they were wrong. So what we did is we actually calculated a distribution of all these structure factors. And if you look at this very carefully, it's probably hard to see, at the low end, oops, the the low values are 49.9, the high value 51.1. So there is actually, they all, they all are 50%. But by having this distribution, we have a lot of data. And we can plot this on a linear scale, over here on a log scale. And the lowest value, the 49.9, is actually 10 standard deviations lower than the mean. So 10 standard deviations is actually significant uh, for even for 2.5 million observations. We weren't happy with this. We said, okay, well, this one looks good. This one also looks good. You can actually see that on this log scale, a Gaussian distribution should be a parabola upside down. A bit like you see in this building, if you look carefully. There's a parabola upside down where the flat surface cuts a, cuts a cylinder. And so this is lots of extra data here. These, all of these should share features of the correct answer. So what we did is we now revert to sequences, but not sequences of amino acids, sequences of subunits. Basically, each of these ring shapes that you saw over here, every single point here is a different combinatorial sequence. When you do that, each ring has its own sequence. We just take the first 10, the 10 with the lowest R value going from 497 to 499. Remember, they're all basically 
But when you actually just look at these top, a consensus, something often done for amino acid sequences, and here it's been done for subunit sequences, immediately indicates that this column is almost always B, D, A, G. You get a very clear consensus, and that consensus agrees with the best one. And it also agrees with what we found by mass spec. So at this point, we felt this seems to work remarkably well. Uh, I'm going to skip that, except to say that the refinement did work very well. In the initial structure, the crystallographers should have been aware because 60% of the phenylalanines were invisible in their uh, electron density map, and that's a very dangerous signal. Uh, they didn't really worry about it. When you put, do things properly, you get very, very good fit. You get a low R3 value, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's good. Okay. At this point, we decided to try even a lower resolution because we really didn't know what's a good resolution. And this gives me an opportunity to sort of mention my hero of science, and, that, and that's Max Perutz. So Max Perutz had invented isomorphic replacement for solving protein crystal structures. His colleague, John Kendrew, had used it to solve myoglobin, which is a much easier system. But for about 10 years, Max would go around carrying a balsa wood model of hemoglobin, where you basically at five angstroms could just see the outline of the structure. Now, hemoglobin is a bit like chaperonin. It's an alpha-beta dimer. Chaperonin is an alpha, beta, gamma, epsilon, zeta, eta, and theta dim dimer. And hemoglobin is about 574 residues in the whole molecule. And here we have almost 18,000. So this is 35 times bigger and you know, at least eight times more complicated. The question was, could our method have solved Brutus' structure for him back then? Now, we didn't actually do that test because that would have been way too cute. Uh, we basically discovered that a Spanish group had crystallized the open form of chaperonin. And they had done this at 5.5 angstrom resolution, and they never even attempted to assign the amino acids. They just said, this is where we don't know what the sequence is at all. So we took this data, and using the same method, we're able to do exactly the same thing. It's a little bit easier because here they only have one of these in the asymmetric unit. So there's only eight times eight factorial do a distribution. Now the distribution starts to look extremely symmetric. This best point is only five or six standard deviations, better than the middle, not very exciting. But again, we use the sequencing averaging technique. And what you now find is that the consensus is less strong. But here you have mostly Z, mostly E, etc. And when you do this, you get an answer, which is essentially the same except for one interchange. So it's as close as you can get, but not be exact. Now this was important because we really knew what the sequence was, but it meant that in the crystal, we could say exactly who was who. And in their crystal structure, they actually saw where the substrate was. So could we now use this information as a way to understand where the substrate is? So I'm gonna just show you what these structures look like. The closed structure from the side and the top, the open structure uh, from the side and the top. And there's a lot of sequence information that I'm going to skip over. Uh, but essentially, you can use these structures to start to understand why nature has done this proliferation of complexity in going from archaea and bacteria to humans. And things. So basically, it turns out that every one of the ATP sites are different, as you'd expect. And it turns out that work that was done by Amnon Horowitz of the Weizmann Institute showed that if you knock out in yeast certain critical aspartic acids in the ATPA sites, then for some of the rings, some of the genes, it doesn't matter at all, and others it's completely lethal. So essentially, some of the uh, subunits really, really care about having ATPA's activity, others don't. You can also look at the rings carefully by contact area and essentially discover that there are, sorry, there are two rings two contacts here, the ZQ contact is much, much weaker than the others. Okay. So this basically tells you that the ring is cracked. So what you start to see is that the ring is different and it's cracked. Uh, then you can actually look at the rings from the top. And since we know where the substrates are from the crystallography, we see something very interesting that basically there are three subunits, G, Z, and Q, in both the closed form and totally independently in the open form that are where the substrate binds. So the substrate binds on the same side where the system is open and closed. 
And it turns out from Horowitz's work that these three subunits don't really care about ATPase activity at all. So you start to see a system where half the ring holds a substrate in a very inactive way, and the other half of the ring starts to open and close and maybe does something interesting. So you can imagine a model where you've just plotted ATPase activity or the, the need for ATPase activity where the substrate is. And then a few months ago, I was visiting Singapore and discovered a building which basically does exactly this. There's a science art museum and essentially it's got, I think it's got nine of these or whatever number, but it's hard to see here. But there are five that are sticking up and so this is a large building. So now you can imagine that what's happening is, is that these loops, these subunits, close and open very quickly. They have different ATPase activity rates. The substrate is held over here. So you can start to think about this is in a very active way, undoing a mess of a protein, a bit like fingers would undo a knot. You grab a piece, pull it out, put it, go back again, grab a piece, pull it out. Now we don't know this, but I think it starts to indicate why nature has been so complicated in making this molecule. Okay, so I'm gonna skip, so what time is. What time should I stop? 10? Okay, good. So uh, there was some other work that I'm gonna skip where we used exactly the same methods for EM. Essentially, what you can do with mass spec is if you know approximately where things are, you can know who they are, right? by whom they're touching in, cross in mass spectrometry. Talking about EM that was done three years ago is really a bad idea nowadays because EM has totally been revolutionized and you can get much higher resolution data by eliminating sample noise. I'm now gonna change directions completely and talk about some very recent work as it unpublished on what we call the language of protein domain architecture. So this is now much closer to sort of the main theme of work uh, at ISMB. The work was done with Andrea Skyevitz. And essentially the idea is, is to map the entire protein universe. And you know, it's ambitious and it basically uses uh, homology where essentially if you know, these are all different sequences and then you happen to know in each of these families something about one member, you can infer that all the other members of the family have share some of those properties. So that's basically the most fundamental property of how, I guess, bioinformatics works. You find something about something, it's close to something else, and therefore it shares properties. Okay. Uh, we did this using a database called CDART that comes from uh, NCBI. There's a sort of equivalent parallel database, but that's not the same, called Interpro. Essentially, what these databases do is they take, there are large libraries of protein domain profiles, PFAM, uh, SMART, CD, etc. And each of these profiles is a sequence and can be matched to a region of all known proteins. So essentially, what CDOT does is, for free, is every month it takes all of the NR non-redundant, which is non-identical sequence database, runs it against all the profiles and tells you that on a certain part of protein sequence, these profiles stick here and these profiles stick here, etc. So our idea was, so when you do this, you could now say, okay, so this is now, uh, this protein sequence is now a domain architecture where we have, you know, an F, we have uh, blue followed by orange, followed by pink, so that we could now define that protein as being a blue-orange-pink architecture. One problem that we have to worry about is that in any kind of attempt to look at words, synonyms can be a real nuisance. And what a synonym is essentially is when two different things act as essentially the same. So you think that they're different, but they're actually the same. And this actually occurs here where different profiles, so here, for example, Profile one, two, and three all map to the same region of the protein. Clearly, by this they are saying that a certain sequence has a certain function or structure or something like this. And very often these make sense because, for example, you could have a profile that's a, a protein kinase, and then a more general profile that's a tyrosine protein kinase, and then a more general profile, a more specific profile that goes another way. So we used quite clever clustering uh, work that was done with uh, Rodel Sharan at Tel Aviv University, we basically used complete disjoint clique determination for any threshold. This is an NP-complete method, but I think all clustering is NP-complete 
And it's way better to stick the MP complete out first and not sort of say we did the clustering right, because any clustering is really, really hard. And if you do it by click solving, at least you can, in, in some cases, get the exact solutions and know how well you're doing. So essentially what you do is a cluster is basically something where all of these things are similar to each other, and these are similar, and maybe there's a, a link here which you're not using. So this actually is saying that this data consists of my full linkage clustering using cliques consists of four clusters. So, and it's again just colored. There's you know, four different colors of four domains. So instead of calling this whatever their names are, we can just simply use something generic like colors. Now, it turns out that the number of unique domains is about 20,000. So we don't use colors, we just use three letter words that we make up. Because three letters, uh, you know, 62 times to the power of three will count for a lot of different things. Initially, we had special symbols in there which caused all sorts of problems because if you call a, a domain a star or an ampersand or a backslash, you have all sorts of problems when you start to match these things. So we, we got rid of that. Okay. So, um, sorry. So basically, you find that there are three kinds of domain architecture, and I should stress that Analyzing protein domain architecture has been done by a lot of different people before we got into this. We were just simply building on their work to see what's happened. So you can divide your protein sequences into three classes. One where, oh, sorry, on the protein sequence, there is a single domain that matches. Here, this domain matches this yellow sequence and this one matches the pink sequence. Then you get cases where there is a more than one domain. And finally, there are proteins that you have no matches to. We call the dark matter. Now, it turns out that surprisingly, but maybe not completely surprisingly, uh, the number of multi-domain uh, proteins is essentially growing as fast as the database is growing. It's essentially growing linearly with sequence. The number of different words is essentially saturated. And this just shows we did uh, a lot of different studies over the years, and essentially this has been constant since there were maybe one million sequences in NR, whereas the number of different combinations is just increasing. There is some downward slope here. These are not completely linear. But essentially, one now sees that we can define the, the diversity in proteins as coming from the order of these words, whereas a word, it would be a profile match along a sequence. So the obvious analogy is to say that these multi-domain architectures are sentences, and these are words. So it just turns out that we recently became interested in the fact that prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and viruses seem to speak different languages. So this just shows how the number of words, say here in uh, magenta, for prokaryotes has saturated, whereas the number of combinations is actually heading towards saturation. For eukaryotes, the number of combinations just seems to be still completely infinite. We're just getting a linear sampling with number of sequences. So basically, it looks like eukaryotes tend to use more complicated sentences than prokaryotes. If you look at this and look very carefully at what virus is doing, viruses actually don't speak a very varied language. They use a small number of words, and they tend to use them in the same way, which is not completely surprising. Okay. Now, it turns surprising that if you actually look at the different sentences, from these different kingdoms of life. The core words overlap enormously. 83% of the words used by prokaryotes are the same as the words used by eukaryotes and viruses. But the sentences are essentially very, very different. Only 4% of the sentences are the same. So this starts to make sense. You've got different kinds of sentences, a common sense. The words, again, this makes perfect biological sense, but again, it's interesting. Uh, now, it turns out that you could actually look at the structure, and this was something that was very interesting during the era of the uh, Structural Genomics Initiative. Um, I guess at least a billion dollars of NIH money, which I wish I could get back right now. But we did solve a lot of structures, or a lot of structures were solved. And the important number here is, is, I'm sorry, is that the fraction of all known sequences that have a structural homology in their family is increasing. 
And it's actually pretty impressive. It's going up from maybe 24% to 28% over here. This is actually happening not necessarily as a result of structural genomics, but as a result of crystallographers now working on diversity. At the same time, the number of sequences has just increased really, really rapidly. So to increase the percentage of a number which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger is impressive. It's even more impressive when you look at the multi-domain architectures, the sentences. Sentences tend to use common words, and common words generally have structures solved. So it turns out that if you just take which sentences are used, which words are used very often in sentences, most of those words have their structure determined. So one way to think about this is that having a structure of a protein is like saying we know something about its meaning. We don't necessarily know that, but at least if we have a structure, it means the material has been purified, it's been crystallized, it's probably been assayed biochemically. So it looks like about 70% of the sentences should be interpretable because we actually know the structures of the proteins. Now, there are still unknown regions in that area. So then we decided to try something that we thought was going to be very difficult, but it was actually very, very easy. So I said over here that prokaryotes and eukaryotes share words, but don't share any sentences. So the question is, is, is it easy or hard if I give you a sentence and say, is it eukaryote or prokaryote, is it an easy or hard discrimination? And we thought it was going to be very hard, but actually it isn't that hard. And we did this using the normal receiver operator characteristic. Essentially, when you do this, you can predict uh, whether a sequence is prokaryote or eukaryote with an accuracy of about 90% the area under the curve being 0.9, which is quite good, it's not superb. And the reason you can do this is that although uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes use the same words, they don't use them with the same frequencies. There are certain words that are used, it's a, a little bit like dialects of a language. Certain people will speak using one particular word, say if you come from Britain, you'll be using the word brilliant, like every second word, whereas in America, you'll never use the word brilliant like this. So the frequency of word use can be a very important discriminant of what the language is. So right now, what we're trying to do is go further. Uh, there are a lot of interesting questions, some of which have been looked at by different people. So for example, does the order of words differ? Is the sentence A, B, does it have the same meaning as the sentence B, A? If you have related species, are some of them A, B, and others B, A? Uh, we've done some preliminary work in this area indicating that the word order does seem to matter, but it's not clear yet. So there's an awful lot of different questions. This is obviously a huge simplification of biology, but it's still really, really complicated and, and fun to look at. So uh, I guess I've told you a little bit about these three different projects, all of which for me have been doing fun with computational biology. And I think I wanted to thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Are there questions? Bonnie. Uh, Microphones? Uh, there. Are... Remember, I'm deaf. I just speak loud. There is a microphone behind you. Have you thought about using digrams and trigrams from cryptography to distinguish between prokaryotes and eukaryotes? Michael? Michael, no, you're the... Uh, not yet. I think uh, we, if, if we had got, you know, an area under the curve of 60%, we probably would have been much keener to do more complicated things. We were using this as a way we were now going to test machine learning and all kinds of tricks to get this to work. I think if we, if we tease down into the data, we are going to find lots of interesting things. But right now, you know, you, you actually might ask, well, why are proteins connected together in this domain architecture? And why is it particularly important in higher organisms? And there actually is a trivial answer. It's a bit like bacteria have uh, proproteins. Basically, by linking these different functions together, they're always going to be expressed in the same compartment in the same numbers.
So it's a way in which you can take different functions that you just like to have around at the same time without any, you know, any syntactic connection between them, just presence. Now, I don't know whether that's true, but that just seems to me to be a perfectly feasible uh, hypothesis. So I guess it's now come to mind that perhaps the first thing we should try to do is to disprove that hypothesis, i.e. find cases where there is more to it than compartmentalization. Another thing that's interesting is a whole area of, of interest is comparing whole genomes. In terms of an evolutionary tree, we can compare sequences, but how, you, how can you compare whole genomes? And it turns out that a bag of words, simply using the words, not even the sentences, is able to make a tree as good as the very best trees people get from using really carefully chosen sets of orthologous sequences. So it's kind of interesting that although, you know, and, that isn't, and those are bags of words that don't even use word frequencies. So the simplest method is actually okay. So we, we need to proceed. I, I mean, sometimes trying something really stupid and simple and not working, you know, is a problem because you wanted to do something cleverer. So my question is, what about the words that we do not know? Okay, so the, the unknown words, what we call the dark matter for obvious reasons, are a problem. Uh, the thing is that something like, so, so, okay, so as the years have gone by, uh, historically we've determined a lot more sequence. The number of sequences, I think, since we started this analysis has gone up from, I think, 2 million to 60 million. The number of profiles has increased, but at a much, much slower rate. I guess the good news is, is that the percentage of dark matter has decreased from about 25% to maybe 20%. But 20% of 60 million is still a really, really big number. And it's not clear. I mean, there are people who say it's because CDART doesn't even use hidden Markov matching. It simply uses profiles. Uh, there are people who claim that if you do more sensitive matching techniques, the amount of dark matter falls to 8 or 9%. There's another school that believes that many of these uh, dark matter proteins are actually disordered proteins, and therefore a different kind of universe. Uh, I really don't know. And, and you know, quite frankly, I think that we know so little about the language that if you actually said, forget about all this, we're just going to simplify focus on two-word sentences, where both structures are known, even known as a complex. This is a really limited set. Can we start to understand how these work? And, you know, I think but people have looked at this a lot. It's not that it's, this is not new. But I think that maybe by taking a more global approach. So what we really need to do is, you know, for every single sentence, know exactly in which, which species it occurs and so on. The analysis is still being done with flat files in Perl, which is sort of what I like to do, and I suddenly realized by remembering a very old technique of merge and sort, we can actually handle the massively large systems without worrying about any of this stuff. I think we have to see. Uh, you know, I, I, the idea here is to be very comprehensive, um, but I agree that uh, the dark matter is a problem. Going off the dark matter was something we actually thought of doing at one point. It's an obvious target, but I actually think it's really, really hard. And you might work really, really hard and discover that you've knocked it down from 20% to 19%. And, and, uh, but I, I actually think that what we see makes a lot of good sense and therefore probably is okay. Um, you know, it, it, it's been interesting to actually ask, if you just look at how, how many different unique words there are as a function of date, as you've gone from this release of PFAM to the next, et cetera, and the number's increasing, but not increasing very quickly. The other thing that relates to this is that it turns out in this work, it's very important to be able to renew, remove synonyms. Because if you didn't remove synonyms, you'd have 50,000 different words instead of 20,000 words. Turns out that one failing of Interpro is that you can't remove synonyms because it doesn't give you the p-value of the match of a profile from every possible source to the sequence. So we're using CDART, it's easy. Thank you. Great talk. Um, I, my question is about the uh, asymmetry of the ATP function in the chaperones. Do you see that same asymmetry in the prokaryotic chaperones as well? So prokaryotic chaperones, by definition, don't have symmetry. But it's important to realize that symmetry 
no molecule is ever symmetric. Symmetry is a thermodynamic property. An ensemble of molecules can, on average, show symmetry. But if you look at a perfect dimer at any point in time, it will never be symmetric. So when a one particular molecule works, you have to have symmetry breaking just by, you know, nothing, these things are not linked together in any mathematical way. So it may turn out that in a stochastic way, the bacterial chaperones do break symmetry. Um, there is, uh, you know, a lot of work has been done on the group one chaperonins. I actually have a, a new postdoc who is, is working in this area or worked in this area for his PhD. And even just understanding how these models are, even if you have identical things, then on average, all possibilities will be equally likely. But any one particular molecule will take a symmetry breaking option. I'm just talking about just how some of the subunits use ATP or are more sensitive to the, to the mutations for the um, aspartate. I'm sorry, but um, so you showed how there's a couple subunits that were more sensitive to the um, ATP function, whereas some were more about binding to the substrate. Do you, still, do you see that same distinction in prokaryotic chaperones? No, in, in, in prokaryotes, they are all identical. In term, on average, they're identical. But it still could mean that, you know, for example, when you bind a substrate, let's just say by chance you bind the substrate to units one, two, and three, by pure chance. The act of binding the substrate has broken the symmetry. And it could be, I mean, you could imagine a model where the similar thing could actually happen in prokaryotes, but you bind the substrate, those units are now gonna be less important for using ATP because they're held in place, and the other units are gonna be more important. So it, I, I think that actually that's a really good point that I never thought about, but I think it's clear that this jump from you know, one gene to, to eight genes probably must have had something earlier on to teach it. The, the cases where they have two genes in, in prokaryotes are very similar, it's just alpha, beta, so it doesn't look like it's very interesting. But I, I think, you know, some of these things would be really fun to simulate. I don't think you could ever do uh, molecular dynamics simulations, but there are discrete simulation methods that could be quite useful for how these things break symmetry and how they work. Thank you. Uh, we have to unfortunately move on. Thanks, Michael, again for letting us stand on your shoulders. <laughs>